What I'm going to tell you about today are what are classed as non-Newtonian fluids. So let me explain a little bit about what those are. So easiest way to think of them is, is to think of some examples. Um, so one class where you get a lot of these non-Newtonian fluids is, is in foods. Um, so things like um, pizza cheese, you can see pizza cheese um, when it's molten, you get these long strings um, and they're, they're quite elastic. Um, egg whites, uh, mayonnaise, bread dough, they're all examples of fluids which are, um, essentially don't have normal, what we would think of as Newtonian properties. Another range of applications is in what are called personal care products, so that's things like um, shampoos, um, shower gel, sun cream, all those sort of things that you, you put on your skin you use for cleaning. Um, those are all, again, examples, if you think about the fluid properties of those, um, again, they're, they're, they're not Newtonian fluids. Um, and then there's a whole class of engineering materials. So, for example, um, molten plastics, um, inks, coatings, um, and drilling mud. So drilling muds are an interesting um, case because what you're trying to do there is you're trying to drill down um, when you're drilling for oil. You're drilling through typically several miles um, underground and obviously as you make the hole you have to get the bits out of the hole um, back up to the surface. Um, and the, So what they have are these so-called drilling muds and they're designed so that they, they can be pumped because you always got to pump them a long distance but they, they also have the property that they'll still carry up these bits of broken rock so that there's quite a lot of um, careful design has to go into those. And there are many more, so those are just, just a few examples. Okay, so what is a Newtonian fluid? Well, the easiest, it goes back to this very simple idea by, by Isaac Newton, which is that it, the, the resistance to sliding one plate um, over another plate um, with fluid, that that resistance, so you express that as a force per unit area, is proportional to the rate of shear. So essentially it's proportional to V over H. And so if I plot stress as a function of strain rate, then I get a, a straight line. Okay. Um, and of course the gradient of that slope is, is, the, is the fluid viscosity. So what is a non-Newtonian fluid? Well, the answer is that a non-Newtonian fluid is basically anything that doesn't obey Newton's postulate. So in that sense, it's an anti-definition rather than a definition. And that means there are many, many different possibilities. So there are many different ways in which fluids can violate this um, Newtonian postulate. And so what I'm going to do today is to show you some of those ways and also some of the mathematics for how we might go around modeling them. Okay. So the first and, and essentially simplest kind of non-Newtonian behavior is to say, well, let's just think about this um, idea of the stress against strain rate in, in a shear flow. And well, it doesn't have to be linear. Okay, it doesn't have to be a linear. We could have essentially a viscosity that varies um, with shear rate. And that's very common. Um, most complex fluid formulations actually tend to be what's called shear thinning, which means that the viscosity decreases as you increase the strain rate. Um, good example of that is paint. Um, if you want to paint your wall, then you want to have a nice thin layer. So you want the fluid to be thin enough that you can spread it nice and evenly. On the other hand, once the paint's up there on the wall and before it dries, um, you'd really rather like it to stay there. So under the very low um, stress imposed by gravity, you want the, um, the paint to essentially be nice and viscous. So that's why you want something that's fairly viscous when it's subject to gravity, but is a lot thinner when you're trying to um, spread it with a brush. Okay, so the, that's the most common form of um, shear dependent viscosity. But there are um, other cases, there are fluids that do the opposite. Um, there's a very famous case um, of um, what the Americans call oobleck, or um, we make it generally out of birds custard mixture or you can do it with cornstarch, but basically it's a fluid that does the opposite behavior. So at low 
um, shear rates, it's quite fluid, but if you try and move it too quickly, then it becomes very rigid, it becomes um, almost solid-like. And just to show you an example of this, um, I've got a movie. Um, so this is my colleague, um, Daniel Reed, uh, and this is a, a large bucket full of this um, custard mixture. You don't follow the, the recipe, by the way. You, you have about one-to-one um, -one mixture of um, custard powder and water, and it makes this very strange fluid. And, and I'll just show you what that does. If I can, so I have to turn the laser pointer off. And so here's um, a movie of. So if he moves quickly, then you see basically he can um, doesn't sink into the custard. So as long as you keep moving, you're you're fine. Um, but if you stop, you, you 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 sink in. There's lots of good examples of that on um, YouTube. If you um, put in sort of running on non-Newtonian fluids in, into YouTube, you'll find some, some really uh, fascinating examples. And just to show that Daniel wasn't the only one who could um, do this. Um, so this was, this was me having a go at the same thing. Okay. So there's another class of, of fluids which are not, in a sense, really liquids. They're what are classed as soft solids. And those are things that require a finite um, stress in order to, in order to yield so typical examples of that are things like uh, toothpastes uh, mayonnaise shower gels anything is actually that the word gel is often um, used to describe these materials so the idea is that they're they're solid up to a point um, but if you squeeze them a bit bit harder than that then then they still flow and so if you look, think about this flow curve it's going to look essentially we now have to have a finite stress before it starts to strain and then typically these fluids tend to be um, shear thinning after that. And you don't even need to have this um, stress strain curve being uh, monotonic. There are examples of fluids, um, so very concentrated surfactants, which form things like what are called worm-like micelles, have this strange behavior where actually this stress versus strain rate curve is um, is multi-valued so for the same stress you can get two different strain rates this third one here is is unstable and so what you get is this thing called shear banding where the the fluid kind of splits into um, a, a high shearing part and a low shearing part but they have the same stress so these are really quite weird materials okay so how do we describe these things well we can essentially um, put in essentially what, whatever function we like to describe the viscosity. So we've now got a viscosity that's um, shear, shear rate dependent. And uh, so typically for a, uh, a shear thinning material, you might want something like this. So the viscosity um, is high at low shear rates, low at high shear rates, and then there's some region in between where it, it does the shear thinning. And so this is a, a sort of typical um, function that people use. It's got lots of constants so you can fit almost any material that you like. Um, and in particular there's a region in down here where the shear viscosity follows a power law. And so actually although this model is quite complicated um, we can look at some of the effects by using this this simple um, power law model. Okay, so the power law model works as follows. So the idea here is that we have um, a viscosity that some power of the um, shear rate. So if, if n is one here, so n minus one is zero, then of course that's just your Newtonian fluid. Um, if n is less than one, then you've got something that's shear thinning. And if n is greater than one, then it's, it's shear thickening. Okay. So let's think now about what happens if um, we do the, the classic calculation of a pressure driven channel flow, but now for a fluid that's given by this power law. So before I do the calculation, I just want you to think about how this flow profile, so if we have a Newtonian fluid, then the, pro -pro the flow profile is um, a parabola. So how's that parabolic shape going to change, or is it going to change, 
if we change to a fluid now with a, a shear dependent viscosity. So anyone got any suggestions? You can um, pull up your hands or, or just think about it. So how, how's, it, how's it going to look if it's shear thinning? No, nobody's brave enough to have an answer. Well, let me give you a, a, a hint. Let's think about how we would do this calculation. So what I have now is I've got a balance between the pressure gradient and um, the gradient of the shear. So that, that's what I get from the um, equations of motion. And so what that tells me is that the shear rate across this um, gap um, is given by is minus g y where g is the um, pressure gradient. So I've got a shear rate that's behaving a bit like this. So I'm going to have high shear rates near the wall and zero shear rate in, in the center of the channel. So now if I've got something that's shear thinning, so this is going to be low shear rates here, high shear rates here. So I'm going to have, if it's shear thinning, then it's going to have a higher viscosity in this region than compared to this region. And shear thickening is going to have the opposite behavior. Okay, so now, in fact, we can, we can actually do this calculation for this nice simple model. So um, essentially, I just balance the shear, um, shear stress now with minus gy. And you can see now why you, you put these you write it in this form and what you find is that the fluid velocity has the form where it's now h to a power n plus 1 over n and minus y over n plus 1 over n. So if n is equal to 1 which is what we have for the Newtonian fluid then you get h squared minus y squared which is what you expect. Now if n is less than 1 then what you get here is a higher power. So h is going to, this is now going to be a higher power compared to um, the square and so you, what you get is something that's more blunt so here for example this is n equals 0.3 n equals a half and so you see you get this more blunted profile because the fluid's thicker in the middle so it doesn't want to shear there and then it's thinner at the wall so it tends to try and shear most most of the shear happens at the wall and then you get rather less in, in the middle and then in the opposite case where i've got the shear thickening fluid well, now it's trying to essentially have a more even um, shear rate across the whole gap. And so in this case, you get a more blunted and ultimately you would get a sort of triangular profile. OK, so that's just one way you can kind of do some fairly simple calculations to understand how, how shear thinning affects the fluid flow. OK, so now here's another um, type of fluid. So these, these are the yield stress fluids. So you can see here, so both of these fluids can be, uh, high shear rates have the same viscosity, but this one you see will flow and this one stays, stays put. Okay, so these are these so-called soft solids. So examples, so this is whipped cream um, that you might get on your, um, put in, on your cake if you like. I think this is probably peanut butter. Um, this is toothpaste and you can see that it, it, if you squeeze toothpaste you can kind of hold a, a layer of, of toothpaste like this, it doesn't move. And of course things like shower gel um, and um, the sort of hand gels that we're now having to put on um, all the time because of COVID. So as we discussed earlier, this the um, stress strain rate curve for this has essentially a, a positive intercept up here and then and so a very simple model of this is that you can say that the zero shear rate for stress below this so-called yield stress. And then above that, we get um, something which in this case could be shear thinning, but we can also take a, a, a simpler model where it's just um, Newtonian. So it just goes like a straight line after that. OK, so what happens now if we think about our flow in a channel again? So the flow in the channel. Again, the stress is still given by this, this um, still proportional to, to the distance um, away from the center line. So what's going to happen now is that near the center line, you're going to be below the yield stress. And so the center part of the um, fluid isn't going to move. And 
the yielding is going to occur near the walls. And so what you'll get here is a, a flow profile that looks like this. So here you've got the unyielded material where you've got your below the yield stress and then you have yielded material here. And this is sometimes called the yield surface, essentially this line bet between the yielding and unyielding fluid. And if you think about how toothpaste comes out of a tube, that's exactly what you see, right? The core of the toothpaste doesn't deform. Um, and what you get is really some shear quite close to the sides of the tube. It's almost as if it slips. OK, so that's one class of models. It's probably the one that um, certainly if you look in a CFD package, it tends to be the thing that they implement in terms of um, non newtonian fluid behavior. It works very well for shear dominated flows. So there's things like injection molding, um, all those sorts of flows are, are nice and easy and you can get quite accurate results using this generalized Newtonian model. Um, so it's easy to incorporate into um, CFD. It's essentially just a small extension of the Newtonian fluid. And uh, also importantly, it only requires you to know about uh, this um, sh shear viscosity as a function of shear rate. And that's something that's relatively easy to measure on a piece of equipment called a rheometer, which essentially just allows you to um, work out the, the resistance at, at uh, a range of different shear rates. The disadvantage with this model is it's really not very interesting. Um, in a some sense, okay, shear thinning gives you a little bit of a change in, in the um, flow profile, but it ignores most of the non if the interesting non newtonian effects. There's a whole load of other non newtonian effects that aren't covered by this model. And in particular, when you go away from um, shear like flows or you go to flows that are time dependent, um, it's really not very accurate. So it's not very good at predicting um, what the flow actually looks like. Okay, so let's move on to some more um, interesting uh, phenomena. Uh, and the first of these is so called rod climbing. This is actually a shear flow, but it's another aspect of it. So what you've got on the left here is um, water being stirred and you can see that the surface goes down um, where the stirrer is and, we'll, and that's due to essentially centrifugal force or centripetal force um, depending on whether you're in physics or engineering. But if you add polymers then what you find is it does the opposite behavior. So now when you stir the fluid up you get this really quite dramatic climbing of the fluid up the, up the stirring rod. And this is typical of, of polymer solutions. Um, it's also something you find if you um, beat up egg whites. So if you beat up egg whites, then what you find is they tend to climb up the spoon. Okay, so what's going on here? Okay, so we, it, as I said, it's, a, it's really still a shear flow. You're, you're, it's a shear flow in a circular direction. But what you've got now is you've got stresses that are happening in, in different directions. So as well as the shear stress, so the component that's, in, if you like, in this case, in the XY component, we have to think about the other components of stress that, that are generated by this, this flow. OK, so if we think about this, um, this particular flow and think about its symmetries, then because there's reflectional symmetry um, in the z direction, you can essentially prove that the uh, these <coughs> x x y sorry x z and y z components are zero. Um, but actually, these normal components of stress, so the stress in the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction, these ones along the the normal the principal axes, um, they don't have to be zero, and they don't have to be um, the same. Now, of course, there is essentially a diagonal component here, which is just the pressure. So we can take that out by subtracting these off. So we can subtract off any of the diagonal components. So if we just take the ZZ one, for example, then what you can see is that in terms of the non-zero components, I've got the, the shear stress, which we, we talked about, but there's also these two stresses, which are essentially contributed from the difference between these, um, principal components. And these are called uh, normal stress differences in shear. 
So actually a, a general steady shear flow um, for a, a general, general material, there are really three functions you have to think about. So there's the viscosity, but there's also these what are called first and second normal stress differences. So then the first normal stress difference is essentially the difference between the flow and the gradient direction, and the second between the gradient and the vorticity direction. So that's the thing to think about. So using those ideas, can we explain what we saw with that rod climbing problem? Okay. So we'll have to use a bit of maths here. So it's a steady flow, but I'm going to keep inertia in here because I want to also think about the case um, of the when we stirred water and the, and the, and the, and the, it went down at the position of the rod. So I've got this, um, what's going to essentially be the Coriolis term, and then I've got to balance that with the pressure gradient, um, the divergence of the stress and gravity. So I think in the, if I look in the axial direction, then essentially what I've got is just the standard hydrostatic pressure. So I've got a hydrostatic pressure term here. I'm going to keep ZZ in because remember that component is, is not necessarily zero now um, because we're stirring it. And then I got this is my standard hydrostatic term. Now let's think about the radial direction. Well, this term here, we get the, um, the sort of centripetal acceleration term. So we get the minus V squared over R term. It's due to the fact you're moving in a circle. Grad P just gives you um, VP by dr. But then this term here, and this is one of the features of um, curvilinear coordinates, is that as well as getting this term here that comes to the gradient of the RR component of stress, you also get a stress difference associated with the fact that the flow is moving around a curve. So this comes essentially straight out of the um, vector calculus. And it's this term that's going to be the one that's going to give us this um, rod climbing effect. So now if I um, take the pressure I had from here, um, differentiate it to put it back into here, then um, what I get is that the um, radial gradient of the height um, with radial distance goes, it has this firstly this term, this is the the rho v squared over r, and that's the one that makes it dip down because this is positive. So that tells you that um, dh by dr must be increasing if I have a, a Newtonian fluid. Then there's this term here, which essentially is coming from um, the second normal stress difference. And then I've got this term here, which you see is of the same form as this one, and that's coming from the first normal stress difference. So the first normal stress difference is really opposing um, the effects of inertia here. So if you have a polymeric fluid, so polymers typically N1 is large and positive, then this term here will overcome the effects of inertia. And so what you'll see is that the fluid climbs up the rod, as we see here, rather than dipping down. It should be said there are some other fluids are out there that um, have, have different behaviors. So in, in, a, in a polymers, um, Sort of N2 is, is quite small, so we normally ignore it. Um, but there are other fluids, for example, if you have dense suspensions of spheres, then actually N2 is negative and quite large, and N1 is, is relatively small. And in that case, again, it will dip, the, uh, the rod will dip down at the surface rather than um, increasing. Okay. And in general, there is this effect that these first normal stress difference effects tend to. Um, oppose inertia. So you get this idea and you can sort of um, work it through by going from this equation, ignored gravity down here, but I can rewrite um, this term here as a Reynolds stress and then what you can see is that the, the sort of Reynolds stress acts really like a sort of negative normal stress in the sense that it's um, a negative contribution in the in the direction of flow. So that's a sort of hand-waving explanation for what a lot of these phenomenon. Okay, so rod climbing is one example of where you can get effects due to um, this so-called first on the stress.
And in terms of what's happening with the polymers, it's really the fact that they're getting stretched in the direction of flow. And so if you want a way of thinking about that, you can think of it as essentially having tension along the streamlines. And that's quite a useful um, way to think about it. And so if you think about the streamlines now being affected like elastic bands, then of course they'll, they'll push the fluid in towards the center. And that's exactly what you see in this uh, rod climbing experiment. So there are other similar phenomena that you can get from um, normal stresses and you can explain them with the same arguments. So for example, there's a thing called die swell. So we're going from here from a shear flow to um, releasing the shear stress. And so because of you've got that um, positive tension in the flow direction, then once you get, once you release that essentially, um, the fluid will contract in the um, axial direction, which means it spreads out in the radius. And so you see this spreading out of the fluid. And you can see this if you, um, shampoo is quite a good example of this. If you squeeze your shampoo out of the container, you often find that it, it, it swells out as it, as it, as it comes out. Um, there's another example here of the orientation of a, of a rod. So if we think about the streamlines around a sedimenting rod. So a sedimenting rod in a Newtonian fluid in the absence of inertia, just sediments without rotating. Um, we'll, we'll cover that when we look at Stokes flow. If you have it in, um, if you think now about the effects of inertia, so then here you would have, um, you've got closely packed streamlines and so you would have sort of low pressure here, higher pressure here. And so actually those will tend to flip and um, sediment um, horizontally. However, the opposite is true here. Now, if you think about the tension in the streamlines in this area and this area, that's going to try and pull the rod um, more towards the center. So it'll sort of rotate until it falls vertically. Um, but I couldn't do the animation to, to do that. Um, and the same thing happens here if you have um, the relative motion of two spheres. Um, if they're falling um, initially side by side through a non Newtonian fluid, then they'll tend to align vertically, which is the opposite again to what happens if you drop them in, um, in a fluid where, where there's inertia. Inertia will tend to go, have them go side by side. Okay. So that's, so far we've only really talked about steady flows and we've talked about um, steady shear flows in particular, but there are lots of other um, examples and uh, a particular one is that these fluids are, have are so-called viscoelastic fluids. And a good example of these is silly putty. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So here is a container. This is this is therapy putty rather than silly putty. Can, can you hope you can see that? I hope you can also see that it's got a flat surface. So it is essentially a, a it's a liquid um, because it assumes the shape of the container. Okay, so let me take it out. Mm -hmm. See here, it's kind of rubbery, it's a bit cold actually. I haven't taken it out. Mm. And you can manipulate it. This is why it's therapy putty, because it's, it's supposed to be good for building up your hands. So if I allow it to flow slowly, so if I just let it fall on the ground, uh, it will flow. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. And it's going to, yeah, here it goes. And you can see that it's flowing here yeah, like a fluid would do. Um, is it going to roll down a bit more? It's a bit cold this morning. Uh, but you can see that it's sort of flowing down like a liquid now. So pull it slowly, it'll just do ductile fracture like a liquid. Pull it quickly and it snaps. So you can see it's got different behaviors depending on how fast you move it. And the other thing you can do with this, um, I should have practiced this this morning. Um, but if I drop it on the table, it bounces just like a piece of rubber. So if we do things 
uh, on a fast time, it's as if it's um, they bounce and break. On the other hand, if you um, put it slowly, and what I'll do now is I'll just um, I think we can still see the camera. I'm going to put it back in its um, back in its container, and what you'll see is it slowly, very very slowly, will spread out, and we'll come back at the end if I remember to see how it, where it's got to. So what this tells you is that these these materials are what's called viscoelastic, because the the nature of the stress is depending upon the strain rate history and not just the current rate of of um, strain rate that you're opposing adding to it. Okay, so here's a, a a video that essentially shows what I was showing before. Um, but this is done. So this is the same material. It's a very similar, um, I think it's a, it's a pink one rather than a, um, a green one, but essentially it's the same type of material. And what I'm going to show you here is this is the thing speeded up, as you can see, by 5,000 times. And on this side, it's going to be slowed down. And so what you're going to see is that um, at very high speeds, it bounces like a ball, but at very low speeds, it sort of pours just as a fluid would. So I should say the, these um, videos I'm showing you that they were made by um, Randy Ewalt's uh, research group. There's some really nice. They've got a, a YouTube channel where they have some really nice demonstrations of these of these things. Um, okay. Okay, so how can we describe these sorts of materials mathematically? Well, I'm going to cheat a bit here because actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to simplify to the case where it's still um, a linear function of strain rate. So we're just looking now at the memory effect. We're not looking at the um, nonlinear effects that we, we looked at earlier. And so now you can, you can think about the stress as being now not um, directly proportional just to the current shear rate but to the shear rate over um, a time history and so you have to have this memory function here um, which is called the relaxation modulus and for these viscoelastic materials essentially this memory decays so if we had an elastic material then of course it would the um, a linear elastic material the um, stress would be a function of the total strain, so it would be essentially um, a constant. So we, this would be a constant over all time, and we would just then get the integral of this, which would be the strain. And this is what happens if we do things quickly with these materials. So if we do things over a very short time, then G doesn't change very much. And so what we get then is we recover a behavior where the stress is essentially elastic with some modulus equal to this um, zero shear time uh, relaxation modulus. On the other hand, if we do things very slowly, then so if you think about the case where gamma dot is now constant, then essentially you can take that outside of the integral and then you just integrate this over all of time. And so the integral of this G, um, this relaxation modulus over time, gives you the steady um, viscosity. And so you recover back to the idea of, of it being a viscous fluid. And so what that means is that a lot of these materials have an intrinsic internal time scale. And how they behave will depend on whether the um, flows that you're um, imposing on it have a faster or a shorter time scale compared to this relaxation time of, of the fluid itself. And another place that this manifests itself is in the, their extensional flows. We haven't talked very much so far about extensional flows, um, but obviously a stretching is, is, a, is, a, is a common way of, of looking at them. And certainly with these, if you think about pizza, but also looking at these pictures down here of a dilute polymer solution. So here's water. You essentially don't get any. Um, the, the fluid breaks straight away, but with the polymers, you get these really elastic, stringy, um, almost like a sheet of um, fluid 
and that's common again for all these um, viscoelastic materials. And as I explained to you in induction, we, one way that this manifests itself is in capillary thinning, where you get the stabilization of these little filaments. Um, and again, as we, we show that when you have these viscoelastic fluids, what you get actually is that this, this thinning rate is controlled now not by the, um, the stress um, or the, the elastic modulus, but by the relaxation time, because what happens is that at each time you've effect effectively got um, a balance between the elastic forces and um, surface tension. And then as it relaxes, it has to find a new equilibrium. And so you get this phenomenon where the radius decays as a function of the relaxation time of the material. Let me go back to the later point of this. Okay, so a particularly dramatic um, effect of all this extension hardening and viscoelasticity is this thing called the open siphon effect. So let me just show you the movie of this. So here is stirring the fluid and you take the stirrer out and you, as you take the stirrer out, you pull a small amount of fluid with it. And then you can see that you pull almost all of the other fluid out of the container. As you might expect, this can make these things very messy, right? Because now you, you can effectively, by spilling a small drop, you'll spill the whole container. This is the same fluid again, but with some silica particles. Um, and actually that makes it less um, likely to do this siphoning effect. So I think we'll, we might as well watch that again, because I quite like that one. So and this is a, essentially it's, a, it's a half a percent of um, polymer called polyethylene oxide in water. That's all you need to get this effect to go. Um, and we'll, again, if, when you, you can see when you add the particles, it actually makes it um, do this uh, less strongly. But the, of the orange fluid, all, almost the entire container um, gets empty. And uh, we made a similar fluid. Um, unfortunately, it's sitting in, in um, Daniel Reed's office, and so I can't get, get a hold of it. Um, and this was a 1% um, solution of um, polyacrylamide, which again is another long chain polymer in glycerin. And you can see, first of all, that it, um, it does this open siphon. It flow, once you get some out, it, it, it flows uphill. And in fact, the only way to stop it is to cut it with a piece of pair of scissors. So it's almost as if it's um, behaving like a piece of elastic rather than a, than a, than a fluid. And it's much more um, dramatic if I can actually show you this in person. Um, so maybe when we get back into the university, I'll try and retrieve the fluid and sh show you it. Okay. So you get this idea that you get this elastic recoil as well as um, things. Okay, so I just want to kind of give you a summary now of the different um, effects. So we've talked about, first of all, nonlinearity, the fact that the um, fluids in shear show these shear thinning, they show normal stress difference effects, such as the rod climbing. And those are essentially steady flow phenomenon, but they're associated with the, essentially the strength of the um, shear rate, which we could characterize as a a velocity divided by a length. And then you have to balance that against something which we can think of as the relaxation time of the polymer. And then there are other cases where these time dependent effects, where now we've got um, essentially a, a battle between the relaxation time of the polymer and the time scale of the flow. So normally these, uh, these dimensionless numbers, which are all over fluid mechanics, are named after um, some scientist usually a, um, a white European male. Um, so, and that is, this is indeed the case with Weissenberg. So Weissenberg was a, a pioneer of um, rheology. However, Deborah is not. Um, so Deborah is um, a judge in the Bible and Deborah talks about um, the flowing of um, the mountains before God. And so this idea um, 
So Reiner, who was one of the, again, another pioneer, thought this was a, a, a really nice metaphor for um, what was happening with these viscoelastic fluids because um, God is omnipotent, so he, his time scale is infinite, and so therefore everything does indeed flow over him um, um, on his time scale. And so this was the idea of the Deborah number. Okay, so this gives us a way of sort of mapping out the space because now I can think of um, an axis of Deborah number and an axis of, of Weissenberg number. And in this space, the Newtonian fluid is, is, the, is the intersection point of the axis. Okay, so a Newtonian fluid corresponds to a Deborah number of zero and a Weissenberg number of zero. So these steady shear flows that we talked about, well, those have zero Deborah number because the um, T here is, is infinite. On the other hand, uh, the Weissenberg number is non-zero. So those um, things like the, the rod climbing, that sort of generalized Newtonian fluid model, you could put along this axis. On the other hand, linear viscoelasticity, that sits along this axis because now we're assuming that the, the Weissenberg number is small, so it's still linear, but we're now allowing for time dependent effects. Okay. The problem with this is that if we think about flow, general flows, then the time scale is always usually essentially the same order of magnitude as um, the shear rate measured as the length of the obstacle um, divided by the velocity. That's the, also the transit time for the fluid going around the obstacle. So actually most fluid flow problems are going to be in this area. And once you get away from the Newtonian fluid, um, then you're really into the deep unknown. Um, and so you've now got essentially too many possibilities to write down a general model that's going to work. So what can we do? So one thing we have, can do is to then, is to simplify this and think about one particular class. Um, so one class of particularly interesting ones are fluids that contain polymers. So a polymer is something like, um, well, its simplest one is polythene. Uh, polythene is basically just a load of carbon and hydrogens bonded together in a sequence. And this sequence is very long. So it's typically um, 100,000 or more. And so if you zoom out from this and stop thinking about this, this chain of carbon atoms, then what you've really got is basically a long piece of string. So it's a long piece of string um, and actually the chemical structure doesn't matter too much. So if you have um, polyethylene or um, polystyrene or polyethylene oxide, they all behave in a very similar way, just in the way that Newtonian fluids are, again, their behavior is somewhat independent of their chemistry. So if we take this this idea, we can now start to think about why these fluids have memory. And they have memory because essentially they, the flow can uncurl these long chains, but the thermal action of, of the fluids will try and restore them back to equilibrium. So the fluid gets dragged out by the polymers, but then they kind of relax back. And that's where you get this memory. Um, and so this, these are some ex experimental observations using um, DNA, which is a giant polymer, so you can actually do some um, clever chemistry on it. You can add fluorescent tags, and so you can actually look at how these things are stretching under, under a light microscope. Um, and this is computer simulation showing that you see exactly the same thing. And so the challenge in this area is to um, really construct mathematical models that are able to predict this stress. Um, but in a way that's tractable, so you can put them in a, in a CFD model, so you can actually um, do some calculations. So that based on this string idea, you can think about going towards something that's a, a, a much more simplified um, mechanical version of this model, um, which I'll show you in a minute. It's going to be a two beads with a spring between them. And from that, you can generate a stress. And once you've got that, you can calculate the flow. And so that give, that's essentially the way that we um, progress in this field. OK, so how do we get this? How do we do this um, essentially model building where you start with this um, 
statistical mechanics of these 3D jointed chains. Um, it's, it's quite a well-developed area. And again, you can think of these polymers as being essentially random walks. Um, they're self-avoiding random walks. They're in constant thermal motion. And the effect of this constant thermal motion superimposed on this random walk is that they is that small bits of them behave a bit like um, springs. So these bits here behave like springs because of the thermal motion that's trying to randomize them. And so from that, you can get this a sort of a coarse grained model, which is essentially beads. So the beads here are to represent the drag of the fluid on the, the polymer chain. And then the springs are the in, in this entropic um, spring force. And so you get this thing called the Zim model. Um, and this is valid for dilute solutions um, reasonably close to equilibrium and it's a molecular theory and you can predict um, fluid properties from that and then the simplest you know, if you coarse grain more and more you can essentially take out each each one of these um, links you can start thinking about combining them together you'll obviously lose some of the degrees of freedom when you do that but ultimately you can get the the gross deformation out from the idea of a dumbbell where you've got um, just a, a single spring which gives you a single relaxation time um, and these can be the linear dumbbells or the so-called um, or finitely extensible ones and here's some math I'm going to perhaps go a little go through this quickly but essentially you can write down now a statistical theory for um, what the suspension of linear dumbbells would do and from that you can get essentially a model for the stress where this stress comes from essentially how stretched out these dumbbells are on average um, compared to the equilibrium which in here is just going to be uh, an isotropic distribution and so the, the entropic stress comes in with these two components and this model gives you two extra um, parameters there's essentially a, a Viscosity ratio, so how much of the viscosity is coming from the, the suspending fluid compared to the, the dumbbells themselves. And then this Debra number, which is essentially just the uh, relaxation time compared to the time scales of the flow. OK, so we could go back now and, and think about our, our flows that we looked at. So what happens to this model in shear flow? Well, the shear stress um, behaves in this way. So you've got a, this, this is the, just the um, background solvent contribution, but the contribution for the dumbbells grows exponentially and to, or decays exponentially to a constant. And so you can see it's viscoelastic, um, but actually it's not shear thinning. So that is one of the disadvantages of this model. Um, however, it does have um, a positive first normal stress difference. So you could use this model to predict the effects, for example, of rod climbing. If you think about extensional flow, then extensional flow, essentially this axial stress um, behaves in this way. And the crucial thing about this is that there's an exponential in here, which will be positive if epsilon dot is greater than a half of the one of the two times the relaxation time. So if the strain rate is hard enough, it will essentially, the stress will grow and grow and grow as if you're stretching a piece of elastic. But if you stretch more slowly, then it will decay and you'll get a constant extensional viscosity. So it's going to behave like um, Newtonian fluid. And so you can think about capillary flows. I think I'll skip through these because um, we're kind of running out of time. But you can use this model then to investigate flow instabilities. Um, so there's a classic one for um, a stagnation point. And there are also important ones in terms of extrusions of polymers because you get melts and, and fractures. OK, so let me just sort of sum up. Um, so my, my summary is really that there's, um, there's a lot more to, to life than, than just Newtonian fluids. There are many, many examples beyond the ones I've shown you. Um, in geophysics, things like ice, mud, and debris flows, they're all non-Newtonian um, fluid flows. Biology is full of non-Newtonian fluids, um, saliva, mucus, blood, again, a whole host of um, fluids. 
and again there's lots of industrial examples polymers suspensions foams liquid crystals colloids surfactants i could go on um, but there's lots and lots of different types of, of fluids and the moral is that this is a big unexplored or generally unexplored area compared to say newtonian fluids with lots of unsolved problems there's many important applications um, and so i think it's just good fun <laughs>